Hi, this is uh, Jay Horowitz with a special edition of Amazing Conversations with uh, Steve Dillon Sr. and Steve Dillon. Um, this podcast will air on 9-11. You know, it's a time of reflection for most Americans, but especially you, you two gentlemen. Steve Sr. was in the police force for 21 years. Mm. Um, Steve Dillon Sr. was in 25 years. Yep. Also served at Ground Zero and the Staten Island Land Kills and the a- NYC Morgue. Jen, what does it mean to you as we get this time of the year, 9-11, what does it mean to your family? The day of 9-11, I was working in Plainview, uh, security, private security, and we had the TV on and we heard about the Twin Towers. And the first thing I thought of was my son being, you know, working in Manhattan, wondering where where he was, what happened, uh, the questions that I couldn't have answers to. So uh, I, I went up to the roof, which was a small roof of the building I was working in, and I could actually see the smoke coming from the, uh, the Twin Towers. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> I couldn't believe what was happening. I didn't want to believe it. I was like in denial that this was a, an attack from uh, a foreign country. Uh, but as far as the the family part of it, uh, my son was a uh, major priority for me. For knowing When did you was, find out he was safe? <clears throat> uh, I, I think it was that night, because uh, we, we had no communication. Yeah. Uh, yeah, all the, Where were you, Steve, that day? I'm so that morning, uh, I was home. Um, it was actually my day off. I was actually scheduled to go into court that day, but they had canceled it before uh, I appeared. So I was home watching TV, and uh, they were talking about a, a small plane hitting one of the towers. <clears throat> and as I was having coffee, uh, we witnessed the second plane hit the towers. And then after that moment, I got a phone call from work saying to come into work, um, to head into, at the time I worked for Manhattan Special Victims up uh, Upper, Bro- upper uh, Manhattan, 3280 Broadway. So I jumped in my car. I drove in, got in uniform. We went right down to ground zero, and it was just total chaos, you know. How long were you there, did you, Steve? Did you arrive after the plane hit? So um, we got down there. I got down there, I guess, just after the second tower collapsed. So sometime before noonish, um, we actually made it down there. Uh, they made us go into work, get into uniform, and then head down. So when was the first time that you, did, you heard from... I, I believe it was that night. <laughs> um, we, we were able to... I don't know how we made contact, <clears throat> whether it was landline or a lot, but uh, when I heard his voice, uh, it, it took a load off of my mind. Uh, and then I was asking him questions, same as you're asking him, what, what was going on? Uh, it was it was really uh, chaotic. Uh, what was going on down there? And I ended the conversation by by my son saying that uh, he would be coming down here more often because of the catastrophic uh, problem that they had down there with the, the buildings and uh, trying to locate all of the firemen and the police. To, uh, it was it was a, a night. Uh, that I would never forget. Steve, how long were you in, at, at Ground Zero for? You said about a month or so? Or? Uh, yeah, so I was down at Ground Zero in Lower Manhattan for the first three or four days. And then that following uh, Monday, they opened up the Staten Island landfill. So all the debris that was being uh, carted uh, to Staten Island from, the, from Ground Zero was now being laid out, and we had to sift through all of that I, I got some numbers for you. Sure. Uh, uh, 1,600, almost 1,600 personal effects, 1. 1.6 pounds of rubble, close to 5,000 human remains. But after all of that, the only unidentified 300 people. Yeah. I mean, how tough was it to be doing what you were doing? You know, uh, it was very tough. Um, the, the first um, load uh, from Ground Zero, when the truck dumped the debris, you could, you could smell like the uh, the flesh, the decaying flesh. There's a, there's a distinctive smell that you'll never forget. Um, you, you smell that, so you knew it was within that, that pile of rubble that they just dumped, and you would sift through it. 
the thing was that when you were sifting through, everything was covered in that dust. So it didn't look like it was human remains. It looked like it was a ball of dust or dirt or um, actually the, the way we like to describe it was it almost looked like, like wet carpet, you know, that had been plastered with this dust. You told me you found a femur on your first yeah, day. Yeah, so the very first day, the, the largest piece of um, the human body we found, and we don't know if it was a man or woman's, was it looked, it appeared to be somebody's leg, their femur, from the knee up to their hip. Um, from that point forward, it was small, small amounts of skin, fingers. Um, it wasn't anything substantial. Remember when, it, when the first attacks first hit, everybody thought, well, there'd be got a lot of survivors, and but there, unfortunately, there were no survivors, really. I mean, it was one or two people pulled out, if you remember. Yeah, so that's because I was in the investigative field. I was a detective at the time. They had us rushing to hospitals the second day to identify people that were going to be brought in. But you're right, nobody, there was nobody brought in. Steve, Senior, did you think your son would follow in your footsteps and become a policeman? Uh, I didn't know what the, where Stephen was going because he, he got out of high school, went to college a little bit, then went into the Navy. So he did a lot. When, when he came out of the Navy, he was uh, trying to find himself. And I had a, a friend that I had worked with in, in the precinct that I worked with who was uh, the director of security at a local hospital. And he called me because he, he knew Stephen and knew of, of, of Stephen and my family. And he said, what, how is he doing? What's he doing? And I said, right now, he's, he's just jumping around. <clears throat> he said, well, I have an opening uh, in, in the building for security. And I said, well, <clears throat> I didn't think of him for doing that, but I will bring it to his attention. And he, he said, I'll give it a shot. And that's when it all began. He went down and to the hospital, became a security officer, and then he promoted to a, a, a corporal. Yep. A corporal yep. uh, and he was on his way. And it's funny that when I retired, I retired in uh, March of 2000, uh, March 90. of 1990. He went on in October. Was that by coincidence, or you planned it like that? Or? No, 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 no. I, I, uh, I had waited three years to get on because it was when uh, Dinkins. It was the uh, the cuts. Yeah. So it took me three years to actually get on. So I think he was waiting out. He was waiting for me to get on, right. and then right, once right, he right. knew that it was going to be that same year, he then. Right, so I, I just missed him. <clears throat> we could have been on the same New York City Police Department at the same time. But when he graduated from the police academy, he graduated out of Madison Square Garden. He came over, and the first thing I said, let, let me see that, his shield. Because he took my shield. He did, yeah. Yeah, he took my shield, and I said, let me look at that shield. And I knew with the markings that I had on there that it was the same shield. You know? So he carried it for the next 25 years. You, you find it in time, this is, this is the 23rd, right, uh, 22nd anniversary. Yeah. This, this, you let me see this thing. Do you think people forget a little bit? I, it doesn't have the. I just bought a press coverage and stuff. It doesn't seem to be as front out there as it was. Be am I wrong? Or I mean, I mean, it just something doesn't seem like it was before. I, I, I agree. I spent um, probably ten years going back. I used to drive one of the widows um, of one of the guys that was killed, and every year going back, it was like reliving it. This, you know, year after year was the same as the previous year. Nothing had changed. But I think now um, it, it is a lot different. I think people tend to forget. And then, you're right, it, it's two decades later, and people, you know, like my kids, they know about 9-11, know I was there. But their generation, you know, it's, it, it, it kind of fades. You know, Steve, well, I've been here with the Mets long, 44 years. And one of the things I'm most proud of is, what we did around that time, you know, the Shea Stanley parking lot was a recovery area. We made constant trips down to Ground Zero, the firehouses, the police stations, you know, and we we had the perfect team. That team was, you know, Leiter and, and Franco, Zeal, Ventura, Piazza, Alfonso. Those guys got, got it, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? We did, I mean, if, if I had anything on my legacy to be a part of that team, I mean, did you? Be, I'm sure you're aware of what we what went on before. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. What yep. the Mets yeah. did for. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think uh, when you show 
the first game after 9-11, right. yeah. uh, that first game when everybody wore the different hats. Hats, yeah. Uh, I think that is an emotional right. uh, um, time of, of the baseball season. That if when you show that, it brings all the emotions back. You need something like that for the people, the younger generation, to understand, you know, okay. what, what happened. Same as for, I'm sure my son doesn't know about Pearl Harbor as much as I do sure. because of the generation gap. You know, my father was, was, it, was in the Army. He was talk, talked about it all the time. So the 9-11, the longer it gets, the shorter people remember. Right. But for you... Uh, and for the people, like you said, Piazza and the boys, when they come forward and, and show the emotions that they did show, I think it helps remember. We, we went to a firehouse the other day with Mike, and you can see the, you know, the cops, the, the, cop, the firemen still appreciated Mike. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, yep. and they had this particular house with those nine guys. I, I remember getting a call right after probably the 25th, and we wore the hats. I think the court officers lost four people. Yep. And one of the widows of the court was so thrilled that <clears throat> her yeah. husband's memory. We, that first year, we wore a, a hat for everybody who lost some, an agency who lost somebody. So it was our way of, and I know we're going to do the same thing. I think the di- I think we played the Diamondbacks. The Diamondbacks and the Mets are still right. you know, wear that. But I want to digress to baseball. Your dad was one of the stars of the old timers they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, 79 years I'm- old. How many? How many did you pitch an inning? I, mean, I pitched. No, I pitched two batters. You pitched two I batters. I pitched Dan, Daniel Murphy and Moogie Wilson. Wow, and, and they both should have been out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I forget what happened. Uh, no, Moogie hit the ball that you know the left the left fielder was playing a little in because he didn't right. think uh, they were going to hit, and it went over his head. And then Daniel Murphy he hit a bloop when the battlefields moved out either because he a little bit younger. He they moved out. He blooped it in. So. Oh. How proud of you of your dad yeah. when he went? Oh, that? very proud. Yeah, that, uh, very as proud. I told you before we got on here, that that game changed my life. You why, know? why is that? People, uh, people are just they they're writing me, uh, asking me to come here. They don't they don't know what I did. They just know what I did that day. Right. But they didn't know sixty years ago that uh, I originally signed with the Yankees and I won fifteen games. In right, the minor Fort league, Lauderdale, right. Fort Lauderdale. Right. So from that, the the Mets grabbed me, and I played four years with the Mets. But I didn't have a a long career. But was I, it three games? It, it, yeah, but I did fulfill my life child's dream of playing in the major leagues. So that went dormant. I became a police officer. Right. They heard the police officer. They wanted me to play for the PBA. The baseball team, I did that. So it was something that was carried on, but my children never saw me pitch yeah. off a professional mound and been in the Major League Baseball uh, t- uh, field. So when this happened, and when I said to you when, you when you called me the first time that I'm in good shape, I can pitch. I well, can, you're in great shape. <laughs> you, you couldn't give me any definite, and I understand. And the day of the game... I was in the clubhouse with uh, um, R- Willie Randolph. Right. And I hadn't met Willie yeah. ever, so I went over and introduced myself, and I, and I told him that I was with the Yankees that one time. And that, that started the ball rolling. Yeah. So and I talked to him for a little bit, but before we ended, I said, Willie, I said, I, I know you, you can't guarantee me, but I'm in good shape. If I can throw, if you can get me in there, I'm be more than happy to. I read a story. I don't know if it's true or not. Did you gave up a home run to Veda Pinson in '64? Oh, Where did you hear that story? I, and that, and <laughs> my man, and that when you came back in, they broke something on the scoreboard, right? Oh, come and on. Casey Stagel said, "If you give him another home, do you have to pay?" That's a true story. Exactly. <laughs> really. <laughs> exactly. This is what well, happened with Otani this week. Well, he broke something on the scoreboard. I, I the first <laughs> I pitched against Cincinnati, and the the batters I <clears throat> the, I pitched two innings. I, I faced Pete Rose, Tommy Harper, Frank Robinson. That's pretty good company. Yeah, and I, and I, I got them out. The next inning, Vader Pinson came up, and I, I had a three and two count. I can remember it. Remember the count, three and two. Right? Oh, yeah, I remember the whole thing. And I said, I'm going to fool him. Man, just, that's how a pitcher thinks. 
I threw him a curveball. Well, he hit it off the scoreboard. <clears throat> so I came in, Casey's here, and I go down to the other end of the dugout. And all of a sudden I hear, hey, Dylan, come on down here. So I said, oh, here we go. I'm going to, he's going to, he's going to give, give it to me now, you know. So I come down and, and, and in front of a lot of ball players, if another ball goes off that scoreboard and it break, you break it again, you're paying. So what did you say? I, I just said, Thank, thanks, Casey. <laughs> what kind of guy was Casey? Oh, he was, he was, he was phenomenal. Um, he, he, was a, such, he had such knowledge of the game. Uh, he, he, he wasn't able to have the mobility. So West Western, I don't know if you remember that I'm name. Number nine. Yeah. He used to be his right arm man. He would, yeah. he would help you, teach you to, but it was coming from Casey. Uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful uh, instructor. Uh, I just, I'm, I'm just diverting a little bit because I want to tell you another story. I was out, uh, first year was with the Mets, they asked me to do a little speaking engagement. So I went, uh, went around the Bronx and everything and did some speaking. I went to a dinner one night and <clears throat> uh, Phil Zulu was supposed to be there. Duke Carmel was there, I think Eddie Cranepool was with me. And um, we were all talking and all of a sudden I hear some, I don't know who he was. And he's talking and he's talking about, and they're talking about Casey, he's talking about, and he's talking down on Casey. So I say to him, who are you? And he wouldn't answer me. I said, when did you play baseball? Well, tell me who you played for. What did you manage? I didn't do any of that. I said, well, leave Casey alone. I was really upset. Yeah, yeah. The next day, I find out Howard Cosell. Really? <laughs> wow. That was Howard Cosell. Pretty good story. <laughs> See, wasn't meant to see your father so happy, and he threw out a first pitch this year at 80 years old. And yeah. What yeah, has it meant for you and your family to see your dad? Uh, yeah, it's been, it's been great. I mean, uh, you, you know, the, most of his brothers and sisters, my brothers and sisters, my kids were there to witness it. So, you know, I'm just fortunate enough that, um, you know, working for the Mets that I can, you know, get to experience it, you know, up close and see him enjoy himself, you know, first pitching in the game and then second come back for the, yeah. for the first pitch. Uh, I mean, it's, it's priceless. That's know? one of the side benefits of the old timers in the game. It's great to see the strawberries are good. But for me, the three stories that stand out were your dad's story, um, uh, John Stearns mm -hmm. yeah, literally yeah. willed himself, John, willed yeah. himself to come back. Yeah. John Stearns was willed himself next to come to me back in, in the clubhouse. Yeah, right and, next he, to he, and he he Wonderful. took ground balls at first base, and a month later he passed. Yeah. I had heard from his family when he got back home. You know, he <clears> gave it all the air. And Frank Thomas, you, yep, you Frank Thomas, I Frank, he time. he fell and yeah. broke his neck, came oh, to the down. game, and passed away that December. Yeah. Wow. Those are to me the stories that. Make it all worthwhile, and the yeah. friend, you know, I, you know, the, we, you know, the reunite with the friendships. You saw, uh, you know, Crane Pool and and and, and Chansky, yeah. some yeah. of the guys yeah. you yeah. played yeah. with. Eddie, Eddie and I played uh, minor league baseball together. I mean, uh, uh, um, high school baseball together. I, I wanted to tell you about. You mentioned Mike Piazza, another another human side of Mike Piazza. <clears throat> when I went to the luncheon, uh, he he was the the first guy that, that I introduced myself, because they really didn't know who I was. Right. And I walked up to him and I said, Mike, Steve Dillon, 63, 64. Steve was so happy that you yeah. are here. We're happy with how you start. He was like, I'm yeah. part of the family. Yeah. You know, here's Mike Biada. That was Talk, the, Yeah, he's, he was, a, was, made me feel really That's good. one of the things that benefits of my job is bringing people back in the family, you know, and yeah. reuniting it. What do you think, what will you gentlemen do today on 9-11? Anything special, different, or? I, I generally don't watch this, the, the reading of the names anymore. It's, it's just. Hey, why is that? Is it too much, or? It, it was. Like I said, I, I drove um, uh, one of the widows down for 10 years, and finally after the 10th year, I had to tell I can't do it anymore. It was just, it, it brings you right back to it every year, and um, it was just too much for me. So I, I, I'll to have a normal day and I'll come here and then enjoy the uh, things the Mets will do for that day. I mean, one last question. When did you, going back to the times you were on in the pile, there was so much hope in the beginning and finding. I mean, when did you really first realize this is just not going to happen? <laughs> when, when you weren't finding anybody. When you, you know, 
there was the distinct sound of the uh, Scott pack, the sirens that were going off, that ringing noise. And once that finally died down, you realize there were tons of tons of pounds of rubble on top of people, and they just weren't coming out. The other thing I read, see, correct me if I'm wrong, people feel there's still remains that haven't been found yet. Is that true, do you think? I Yeah, I, I think so. And it's like I described, it, it, the landfill, you know, you're sifting through things, and eventually it went from big piles to little piles to piles on a conveyor belt, and you couldn't tell if it was a, a piece of flesh or not because it was so dirty. So, we, yeah, I, I, I truly believe that there are still remains probably somewhere in the Staten Island landfill. I, I, the, what do you think you're going to be we, doing? We'll, well, I, I used to listen to my wife. Uh, we had a neighbor. His name was Michael Kelly. His wife is still in the neighborhood. Uh, he, was on, he was working for some uh, financial investor. <coughs> he, he was never found. And we, we watched the names. Uh, we, we, now that I'm retired... I can watch the whole thing, uh, and we just reminisce on it. And uh, my daughter, Christine, is, is a, a close friend of, of this, the wife of the gentleman that died. And uh, uh, we'll, call, we'll call her and, and see how she's doing, the, the wife. And right. uh, it brings it all back, like my son said. It, 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 but it's a reality that uh, so, it's so, there. So the, the woman he's talking about, uh, Joe Kelly. Joe Kelly. Her... her Husband was killed, Kent Fitzgerald. So the following day or the day after, we had put together these packs to collect DNA. So I actually drove out to her house, collected toothbrush, hairbrush from, and I believe seven years, eight years later, they found found his remains. Really? Partial remains, yep. Yeah, so they were able to tell her that, you know, well, his remains were found. That's, a, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's not... Perfect, but it's great, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were also assigned to the armory on Lexington Avenue. That's where all the, I don't know if you remember seeing people having the pictures of their family members saying missing, and they would come there, and we would tell them. They had the little billboards and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yep, and they were told to come with some some piece of toothbrush, hairbrush that had day and DNA on it, so we could take descriptions and put that in, and that's what went to the morgue and sat until they found they would check it against every piece of DNA that they had. Well, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. And you, you promise you'll be pitching in the next old timers game? I, I'm ready. Okay. Thank <laughs> you, sir. <laughs> Steve, as always, thanks, thanks man. Jay. Appreciate thanks it. Thanks for your time. You got it.